Sidebar is brought to you by Monterey College of Law, San Luis Obispo College of Law, Kern County College of Law, Empire College of Law located in Santa Rosa, and the Colleges of Law with campuses in Santa Barbara and Ventura. Welcome to Sidebar, discussions with local, state, and national experts about protecting our most critical individual and civil rights. Co-hosts, Law Dean's Jackie Gardena and Mitch Winnick. Covering the court today is very different than it was 10 years ago. We have many more platforms than we used to. I count on my colleagues who don't cover the court on a daily basis to do the real investigative reporting. And I want to give it every piece of credit it deserves when it delivers the goods. That's our guest, Nina Totenberg, author and NPR legal correspondent. Jackie and I are thrilled to have one of our personal media heroes join us today on Sidebar, NPR's Supreme Court correspondent, Nina Totenberg. Nina brings a unique multi-decade perspective on the Supreme Court, its personalities, policies, processes, and politics. She also provided us with an amazingly warm and personal memoir titled Dinners with Ruth about her lifelong friendships and relationships with Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, many other Supreme Court justices, and other notable Washington, D.C. policymakers. Nina, Welcome to Sidebar. Thank you for having me. Really enjoyed the book and the inside look it gave me, not just at your life, but at the world in which you've worked. One of the things that I want to do is, is really start at the beginning of your career. You took some big risks for that day and age. You made a decision to start a career, to not get married right away, and you were really swimming against the tide. I'm familiar with the battles that women fought in the legal profession as they tried to make their way, but I was less familiar and hadn't thought about the journalism field and what it was like there. You had to build relationships and gain the confidence of men with a lot of power. And I'm curious how you needed to approach that differently than your male colleagues. Well, you know, there were very few of us, literally a handful of us, who were in Washington anyway, in the journalism profession. Before that, I, I worked in Boston, which was just as exclusively male. And, you know, you just had to try to persuade people that you could do a job. And that meant you had to work twice as hard. It meant you had to be pretty tough. And at the same time, bat your eyelashes a little bit. And to sort of suck it up to a kind of harassment that today would just be unheard of, really, institutional harassment that would be unheard of. It was very difficult, I would admit, but at the same time, it's what I wanted to do. And, you know, you said, well, I decided not to get married. Well, excuse me, nobody, nobody asked me. <laughs> and when I did get married, I had to put some thought into how we were going to handle that. And I was by then about 35. But in truth, you're giving me credit for making some decisions I didn't make. If you were a young woman trying to conquer the world, the likelihood is that you would get lots of passes from men, but you wouldn't get any marriage proposals. I thought what was interesting in the book is that when you did get married, you then had to negotiate that I'm going to be out late or I'm going to not be available in the evenings because there was an expectation about what it is that you would be doing as a married woman. You had to negotiate those things at work and you had to negotiate those things at home. I mean, we all did. We really all did. One of the great things about going to work at NPR when I did was that it was mainly female. The reporters were mainly female. It's where I went, met Linda Wertheimer, where eventually we got Koki Roberts hired where I knew Susan Stamberg as a colleague. And Linda and Koki and I all sat together. And it was remarkable how we were always, even then, negotiating our relationships with our husbands. Because it always means that you have to take some time away from them. And the expectation at the time was that you shouldn't be doing that. Today, I think most younger men 
hopefully have some notion that their wives, they're not going to be June Cleaver. That wasn't the way it was many decades ago. Nina, you've said many times that what's sometimes referred to as the four mothers of NPR, you, Linda, Susan, and Koki, were an essential and critical aspect of your success and, and the success of NPR. But modern-day Nina Totenbergs are filling stories via the internet and social media from their phone, most likely never meeting their media colleagues or their story subjects in person, and they operate without the benefit of mentors, collegial relationships, or social engagement. You write that the foundation of your success are the relationships you relied on throughout your career and your proximity to the source of stories. How will we ever have future Totenbergs, Stanbergs, Wertheimers, and Roberts in a remote, impersonal social media world? Well, that's why I tell people to go back to work. All of my friends in my 30s, 40s, and on were people I met in one way or another through work. And I never broke a really good story without knowing people face to face. I still don't think you cover one covers a hearing nearly as well if you're not physically there, although I do sometimes cover it remotely. But you don't see what's going on other than the speakers if you're just watching it on C-SPAN. A journalist is supposed to cover life as we know it. And life as we know it now, and as we should know it, is with actual human beings speaking or performing face-to-face with other people. And I don't think you can do it really well if you just do it on Zoom. I do want to talk about the span of your career. As I read the book and I know the work that you've done for decades, it is just amazing to me that you have been a witness to so much history. You were there when Roe was first decided, and you were there when Roe was overturned. And given that kind of perspective that you have, what stands out to you as really pivotal moments in the court's history that maybe you didn't even recognize at the time? Well, I certainly didn't recognize how important Roe would be. I knew how important it was to a lot of women, but I did not understand for quite a while its political significance and how it would, in fact, be something of a cleaver between pro-life and pro-choice forces and that they would increasingly become farther and farther apart, more and more adamant, and how it was never going to change. And I (laughs) I think if Sam Alito lives for another 20 years, he may discover that even though he thought he was putting an end to this dispute, he wasn't putting an end to this dispute. And I didn't, I was pretty young at the time, I didn't appreciate the consequences politically. You know, and I didn't cover the court full-time in those days. It was one of many things I covered. I covered the Justice Department. I covered the House and Senate Judiciary Committees. I covered the, every special prosecutor. I even covered the intelligence community. Not very well, but I covered it. Um, And I didn't go to court nearly as often as I do today. The pandemic was the best illustration of how this is not a way to cover an institution. And it wasn't a good way for the institution to get along either. They couldn't see each other. They didn't do Zoom. They did it by phone because they were worried about being bombed from outside. They had to question people in a different manner. The advocates didn't like it. The justices didn't like it. It gave them less an idea of how to proceed in this case. Oral argument was fairly worthless. And I would argue still is partially worthless because it goes on too long today because they started doing that to atone for the fact that they, or compensate for the fact that they had to go in order. And so they went multiple, multiple rounds. And they still do that. It really is, in some ways, I think, a waste of their time, too. It used to be a fairly compressed process. It was very lively, let's say. Perhaps junior justices didn't get in as many questions. At least that's what they tell me. So they like it this way. But it doesn't work nearly as well, I think, as the old way. 
And in fact, the lawyers live in terror because it could go on for hours. Instead of a half an hour, it can end up being two hours. To be prepared for that is different than being prepared for a half hour. So it was an exercise in how not to cover a major institution. We could only hear them. We couldn't see them. It went on forever. Sometimes my task was to stay awake. And I, I just think it didn't work very well. And it's a good example of why they don't do that anymore. And the minute they could go back to work, they did go back to work in terms of being with each other and not on a Zoom call at oral argument. Just to follow up on, on your statement about the pandemic and its effect on the court, but we had at least two justices who were fairly new when the pandemic hit, and then we had one who became a justice during the pandemic. Do you think that it interfered with the development of relationships and trust and collegiality? It's hard to measure. That's really very hard to measure. I think probably the leak of the Dobbs case had more to do with ruining some relationships. Do you want to break any news here on the podcast about who actually leaked the Dobbs opinion? No, I don't know. Sam Alito says he knows. I think I know who he thinks it is. And I think that they spent a lot of time trying to prove that and were unable to. Having been this subject of speculation about who were my sources in previous groups, I know how far afield you can get in those things. Nina, can I follow up on this idea of the court's relationship with the general public? Our recent guest, Professor Stephen Vladek, wrote a book called The Shadow Docket. And as you well know, that's the practice in which the Supreme Court is issuing dozens of decisions without oral arguments, without written briefs, without published opinions. And evidently, the court's taken steps to restrict oral arguments or oral dissents in controversial cases. As a reporter, are you alarmed? And should we be concerned about these changes that make the court's actions more secret, you know, less transparent, and less accountable to the public? Well, let's do the shadow docket first. The shadow docket exploded during the Trump administration when it kept trying to do things that had never been done before, and it succeeded significantly. They would get a, a decision they liked or didn't like, usually didn't like, and they would have skip over the Court of Appeals process and go directly to the Supreme Court and ask the court to stay the lower court order, meaning block it from going into effect. And increasingly, they succeeded at that. It took them three tries to do it in the travel ban case, but they finally got it cleaned up enough that the court would buy it. But as a result of a court that was very welcoming to shadow docket cases, and very unusual cases from the Trump administration. Professor Vladek started focusing on it. So if you compare the 16 years of the Bush administration and the Obama administrations and the number of times they went to the Supreme Court and asked for the court to take extraordinary measures to stop a lower court decision from taking place, you know, to interfere with a lower court order, as I recall, there were 16 cases, eight each in the eight years of the Obama and Bush administrations. And there were four times that number. I think he said 41 on our yeah. show. It quadrupled. And I think it's a little bit, it's quite a bit reduced now. First of all, the Biden administration doesn't go running to the court every other minute. Secondly, the court, I think, has come to some sort of a realization, partly through the, some of the discussion about the shadow docket in Professor Vladek's book and elsewhere, that it is unseemly at times what they were doing. And, but even more important, I think, to them, it's likely that they've made their workplace much more difficult. Because once you sort of say, hi, we're open for business to the executive branch and to other people who want to go running to you before you go through the normal litigation process, it means that lots of other people will do the same thing. And I've had the sense that the court is more willing lately to say, no, we don't need to interfere with this now. 
it used to be I had no idea what was going to happen. Something that looked like it had no legs at that point. The Supreme Court would block the lower court order. But I would say that now I, I think the court has a more realistic approach to these cases and whether they really want to short circuit the normal process. That's one thing I would say. They did stop doing oral announcements of opinions, not just during the height of the pandemic when they were all at home, but even when they went back to work. So in the 21-2022 term, they were at work. They heard cases in the courtroom. Press was there. The regular people holding press credentials were there, but they did not have announcements of opinions. And they did not, as a consequence, and not incidentally, I suspect, have dissents from opinions. And I was told that at least some of the folks on the court wanted to be able to dissent publicly and orally from the bench, and that was not going to happen. However, now that the court is open to the public, not just to lawyers and members of the press, they have resumed having oral summations of opinions and dissents. So this term, we're back to normal. We are going to take a brief break. And when Jackie and I return, we will continue our conversation with NPR Supreme Court correspondent Nina Totenberg. Nina has decades of experience covering the Supreme Court. And in addition to being an eyewitness to many of the most important constitutional decisions of our time, she has observed how the relationships between members of the court play an important role in the development of majority decisions. When we return, we will continue to discuss this issue as well as the role that transparency, accountability, and the lack of a code of ethics may be having on the level of public trust in the court. Kaplan is the only major bar review offering live instruction with both live and on-demand classes. Join a real-time or on-demand class, stay on track with personalized study plans, and learn from expert attorneys. Find your bar review at captest.com bar. Welcome to the future of legal intelligence. Trellis, a state trial court research and analytics solution. Trellis offers state trial court records for legal research with analysis on judges, opposing counsel, verdicts, motions, dockets, and legal issues. Visit our website, trellis.law. Welcome back. We're talking with Nina Totenberg, National Public Radio's award-winning Supreme Court correspondent. After covering the court for almost five decades, Nina has a unique perspective of the current controversy over the lack of a Supreme Court code of ethics. I want to stay on that idea of transparency and accountability because the court has certainly had a lot of issues come up lately, thanks to the media reporting about ethical issues, financial disclosures, undue influence potentially of the court, or at least the appearance of impropriety. You've noted that the court depends on its legitimacy and public confidence in how it appears, but public confidence in the court is at an all-time low right now. Given your unique perspective, how did we get here It almost seems like defensive about its ethical lapses and failure to disclose. The court has systematically and continually refused to write an ethics code for itself, contending that it has different problems than the lower courts, which it does, because in the lower courts, if you recuse yourself, just sub in another judge, and there isn't another judge to sub in. You don't want to normally have a a cast of eight in a contentious case, for example, where it could be tied, in which case the lower court's decision stands and you've done the whole exercise for no good reason. That said, I think the chief would very much like to write some sort of an ethics code. And I initially thought that there wasn't one because a couple of people were hanging back. A couple of the members of the court didn't want to do that. And unless you have it for everybody, you don't really have a code of ethics. If they say, I don't agree with a code of ethics, then 
if two people do, then you don't have a code of ethics for the court. And then several people that I know, you know, who are judges said, well, he should just go ahead and do it regardless. And then it was suggested to me that perhaps he doesn't even have five votes for a code, a specific code of ethics, which he might not, in which case he doesn't have a code of ethics. He has a very difficult task. Let's face it, this is not an easy job he's got. And some justices, I suspect, feel that they make money that most Americans think sounds like a lot of money, but living in Washington, D.C., having children to pay for their college educations and all of that, it's difficult. And they ha need some other sources of income, including, for example, getting paid a lot of money for writing books, more money than seems appropriate in some cases, and teaching. There's a cap on teaching, which is $30,000 in income. They get invited someplace nice that maybe they shouldn't go to that nice place because that person might at some point have a case before the court or contribute to a cause that supports cases like this before the court. I think some of the justices have been callous in their disregard of common sense about this. That's on the one hand. And I think the examples are fairly obvious. Justice Thomas is one. I don't know that Justice Alito took other all expense paid trips paid for by people who had issues before the court. And I do accept the idea that people do make mistakes, that they fail to recuse because they didn't realize somebody was involved in a case. And most of these cases where you see it pointed out that there were cases they should have recused from. These are not cases that the court heard. These are cases the court didn't hear. So the actual damage is probably not huge, but the actual damage in terms of the optics and the understanding of the general American public is huge because they don't get to do those things and they have rules they have to live by. You know, if I were, for example, to have a fundraiser for a member of Congress at my house, I could be fired for that. I certainly would be taken to the woodshed over that. That is against the rules. And you did get a lot of pushback when you, the book came out about the relationship that you had with Ruth Bader Ginsburg and other justices. And so a very public pushback. Actually, the most pushback was actually from our own ombudsman. There's a very great value to having an ombudsman. But sometimes ombuds people don't actually practice journalism. And so the idea that you would not cover people you know is contrary to what we do for a living. You get to know people on purpose so that they trust you and you will be able to talk to them about what they do. Now, that is more so when you're covering Congress and the White House than it is the court because the justices can't talk to a journalist about a case, certainly not a case that is ongoing in any way, shape, or form. But knowing them is worth something. Now, when I knew Ruth Bader Ginsburg first, we were both very young women. I knew her for almost 50 years. She was in her 30s. I was in my 20s. And she wasn't a judge. She was beginning her fight for women's equality under the law. That's how I got to know her initially. And you don't divorce a longtime friend just because they succeed in life. That seems to be to be a fairly obvious proposition. But I do think there is no rule that you can't have friends. There are rules about financial conflicts and about conflicts of interest. If a journalist were to help somebody whose campaign she were covering. We have rules against contributing to fundraisers. And in fact, there's a very funny story. When I was first married to my husband, somebody gave him free tickets for some rock performer. I can't remember who. Annie, maybe somebody. I don't remember who. I'm not a big rock star person. And he was very excited we were going. He said, then he dropped something. And I said, who is sponsoring this event that we are, we've been invited to? And he said, it's a Planned Parenthood event. And I said, David, I, I can't go to that. I cover Planned Parenthood stuff before the Supreme Court. 
I certainly can't accept a free ticket to a concert that they're sponsoring. <laughs> Nina, could I go back to Justice Roberts for a minute? Because to some extent, I know you were not trying to give him a pass. You were just observing what you think's going on. But there are over 10,000 judges in the United States, and every single one of them except the nine sign and agree to very basic, straightforward transparency and reporting rules. The idea that somehow he and his eight colleagues don't quite get the concept that the American public wants transparency and reporting of the highest court of the land just doesn't ring true. How can he, in this case the chief, be willing to risk his legacy on what just doesn't seem to be a defensible position? Well, first of all, I'm not sure that it's his legacy, but I think if you don't have the votes, you don't have the votes. He does. He needs the other people to agree, not just to the concept of, of a code of ethics, but specifics. And believe me, they can find lots of things to sort of muddy the waters. That said, I agree with you, every other judge in the federal system, and in fact, in most state systems, have to abide. Local as well. Local justice is the piece. I mean, it goes down to the most yes. basic and both, and level. And many of those people do totally disregard them. And nobody holds them to account. But they, but they say, you know, there is a code. They don't abide by it. And it usually takes years for some of the judges in the federal system to report their financial the Supreme Court is much more timely about at least filing its financial reports, which it does completely concede it has to file. And the rules were muddy until recently about whether they could accept private hospitality. Millions of dollars? Come on, Nina. I'm not sure how vague that was. Millions of dollars and no disclosure whatsoever? That seems to be a bit of an extreme well, stretch of I'm not standing, a technicality I'm not from the justice's I'm standpoint, the not from your standpoint. Not explicit. They they viewed it the way they wanted to view it, and nobody held them to their feet to the fire over it. But now it is explicit. You cannot take a free trip on anything other than the private personal property, not the business property, but the personal property of the person who has been your friend. Well, and I, I want to talk about the the kind of the consequences of public, the lack of public confidence in the court or the legitimacy of the court. You know, the Supreme Court this last term issued a decision that ordered Alabama to redraw its district maps because the previous maps violated the Voting Rights Act. Alabama has redrawn their maps and the maps don't appear to conform to the Supreme Court's order. And in fact, it's been defined as Alabama defies Supreme Court order. How should the court respond to that? Well, first of all, it depends. <laughs> you know, I, Good lawyer answer. Well, no, it, it definitely depends because as I understand it, the attorney general in Alabama and others deliberately did this in order to bring the case back to the Supreme Court so they could challenge Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. They thought they didn't get, the court didn't take their argument seriously about that, and that if they go back, they might get a decision striking down Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. You know, it only takes four votes to hear a case, and there might be four votes on the court. But I don't think that the Black voters have much of a choice in this. I think they they have to hold the court's feet to the fire. And if they lose, they lose. Because that's going to be two, probably two House elections, 22 and 24, that arguably will now be under maps that violate the Voting Rights Act. Well, I think that they would probably go back to the court very quickly. I think that they would not wait on this. The court that heard this before will either say that you're right or you're wrong and you have defied the what the Supreme Court said. And then the Alabama attorney general can go up to the Supreme Court and the court may not want to take the case. It doesn't have to take the case if they lose in the Court of Appeals. But if the Court of Appeals sides with Alabama and says this is enough, 
then the court either has to take the case or basically portray itself as a bit of a patsy on race. We're going to take another brief break. When we return, we will discuss Nina's observations that the lack of an ideological center of the court has laid the groundwork for the recent pattern of conservative ideology in Supreme Court decisions. The Legal Technology Assessment, LTA, by ProCertis is a benchmark assessment and a training platform for law students and all legal professionals. Our online application establishes fluency within the most widely used tools of the trade. ProCertis is reshaping online learning. Come check us out at www.procertis.com. The Master of Arts in Law degree from the Colleges of Law was designed to empower working professionals to become innovative problem solvers in careers that intersect with the law. The legal field is more than what happens in a courtroom after all. The Colleges of Law. Learn more at collegesoflaw.edu. Welcome back to our conversation with Nina Totenberg, NPR's legal affairs correspondent. You know, one of the things that Jackie and I, I like to do with our podcast, no surprise as educators, is to cast a little more broadly to the listening public. You have talked about the idea that it's only when there's an ideological center of the court that precedent and legal reasoning are more influential in the critical court decisions, and it overrules ideological, religious, and political orientation. So to those who don't understand the workings of the Supreme Court, as you do, what does having a center mean? And with that definition, what are you observing about the relationship between the current court justices? Well, having a center means that extremes on either the right or the left automatically prevail just by sheer numbers, at least on the most charged cases. And I had never covered a court that didn't have a center until this one. And the closest to a center is probably the chief justice, who on any court 20 years ago would have been considered on the right, the right flank, and to a lesser extent, Justice Kavanaugh. But for most practical purposes, there isn't a center on this court because there's a sixth justice conservative majority, meaning that unless you can get not just one, but two members of a quite ideologically dedicated conservative majority, you're out of luck. So that means they prevail almost all the time in the most ideologically charged cases. People will always say, look at all the 9-0 or 8-1 cases. There are so many of them. Yes, there are so many of them because those are the easy cases. (laughs) They're not the hard ones. It's the hard ones where that that, that is not true. And so I, I just, as for what their relationships are, I think they're pretty fraught. I think the conservatives don't necessarily get along with each other. Many of them think individually that their views are more interesting and important than other people's views. And even though they join an opinion, they write separately. I think the chief justice's opinion in the affirmative action case was like 40 pages long, and there were 91 pages of concurring opinions. The vast majority of that was was Thomas, but there were others too. I want to zero in on the Thomas concurrence in the affirmative action, because it really took aim at Justice Jackson's dissent in a way that felt very personal. So I'm curious about how you perceived that concurrence. I think you've talked about it being (laughs) uncivil dialogue from the court that you found very surprising. I I wrote a piece about some of, about the concurrences and dissents because I didn't say, I don't think I said uncivil. I said with respect and not with respect. And Thomas went after Jackson for six solid pages, hammer and tong. You're right, in a very personal way. And she's the only other African-American on the court. She responded in a most restrained way in just a footnote saying, he's criticizing me for a dissenting decision I did not write and so many straw men that I could not possibly 
do justice to getting rid of them in a single opinion. So she just didn't take the bait. But Justice Sotomayor wrote the Harvard and, and principal dissent. He took out after her too, but not in such a personal way at all. So it was just interesting. It was noteworthy. I do want to go back to the Roberts question about being a, a center or attempting to be a center. And I, I want to think about it, a uh, difference between process versus ideology. I've heard some people describe Roberts as wanting the same endpoint as the conservative majority, but he'd rather take a local train, whereas the other five want to jump on the express. Do you think that's an accurate representation? I think that's an accurate representation up to a point. But he's very skilled about it. And he also understands that you can stop a local a lot faster than you can stop a speeding express train when it gets out of out of hand. And you see that in the abortion decision where he would have done something far less. He would have not invalidated Roe. He would have done what Mississippi asked to begin with. He would have said, OK, no abortions after 15 weeks. That would have become the norm. And then you would have seen other attempts to bring it down still further. Whether or if it, the train would have stopped, I don't know. But I always figured in years past that Roe would get nickel and dimed away, but would still partially be there. And then about four or five years ago, I realized it was not going to be there. You see that even in this term. Take the independent state legislature case the case about whether courts have the power to review congressional redistricting, state courts. The state of North Carolina took the position that the courts had no role to play in this, that the Constitution gives this entirely to the states. This is a pretty radical idea. There were a lot of big-time conservatives who opposed it, filed briefs in addition to liberals. It goes to the court. The court decides it and says... Of course, courts can have some jurisdiction as long as they act reasonably. The chief justice writes the opinion. He gets the three liberals with him and Kavanaugh and, and Barrett. But there's no definition, no standard for what reasonableness is. But if he hadn't done that, he A, didn't have a majority because there were obviously at least three people on that court, maybe four, who really were more pro-North Carolina. And if he'd said what he wanted his standard to be, which he clearly sort of suggested it, he wouldn't have had the three liberals. And then he wouldn't have had a majority. So he does what he can with what he can. And that's called leadership. That's what you do when you want to get something done. And you don't want to just sort of stand up and yell all the time. And I think he did that pretty effectively in that and other cases this term. You wrote about Ruth Bader Ginsburg in some of her decisions of taking that approach, that there was some incrementalism that she thought would lay the foundation for a longer-term legal policy for the country. I do see that in Roberts. I will give him credit for that, despite my concern about his lack of a code of ethics, but we'll set that aside. But do you see some parallelism between the thoughtfulness of how RBG went through that and when Roberts is being thoughtful, how he's acting as chief? I think there are some parallels, but she was always a get it, get it done person. If you could get something, something was better than nothing. On the other hand, when Roberts wrote an opinion upholding the Voting Rights Act, the first decision he wrote, upholding the Voting Rights Act, but making very clear that it was on borrowed time. I think it was the Austin case, a Texas case. And then a few years later comes Shelby County, and he invalidates the Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which required preclearance of new laws in areas that had a history of discrimination. In the first case, she actually joined an opinion that she clearly didn't agree with in hopes that it might actually stave off something worse from happening. But she had no hesitation about dissenting when the court did strike down Section 5, 
she actually dissented from part of Robert's opinion in the Affordable Care Act case. And you could say she went off on her a frolic of her own. She and I think Sotomayor, who just wouldn't sign on to this central compromise thing that Breyer signed on to. She just wasn't going to do it. She'd had it. But you don't expect people always to be leaders. Sometimes they are leaders by just staking out a position they want to stake out. We are going to take a final break, and when we return, we're going to discuss with our guest, NPR correspondent Nina Totenberg, the question of how current reporters and commentators should be covering this Supreme Court, particularly since much of the recent news coverage has strayed from the court's legal decisions into questions about individual justices' ethical behavior. San Luis Obispo College of Law offers on-site and hybrid online evening classes that provide you the option to continue working while attending law school. To learn more about their accredited degree programs or to apply for their next term, go to slowlaw.org. That's S-L-O law.org. Your community, your law school, your future. Jackie and I would like to take a quick minute to recommend a great podcast that, like ours, is dedicated to understanding the big issues facing our democracy. An honorable profession profiles the rising stars in American politics. From mayors to attorney generals, an honorable profession gives listeners a view from the front lines of our democracy. We're almost out of time and so many more questions, but we're going to leave with your area of expertise. There's been a lot written lately. Dahlia Lithwick and some others who cover the court have raised questions about whether or not the press needs to cover the court differently because the court is acting differently. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how the court should be covered going forward. Well, I'm very glad you asked this question because I actually agree and don't agree with Dahlia and some other people who've made this point. I'm going to cover the court the way I always have. And that does not include necessarily being on their tails all the time about every jot and tittle of their financial disclosure forms. I'll do what I can, but there's a limit to what I can do. Those are the kinds of stories that investigative reporters can spend months on and sometimes come up with a great story like ProPublica did about Thomas, and in fact, about Alito. But I want to point out that there are a lot of other stories that have been written, that even ethics professors who are very critical of the court for not having an ethics code think are a lot of talk about nothing. Some of the ethics stories that I read amount to another good story ruined by the facts. (laughs) And you have to be willing to walk away I don't have time to do that. Covering the court today is very different than it was 10 years ago because the shadow docket is still omnipresent. We have many more platforms than we used to. I now not only cover the court for Morning Edition and All Things Considered and sometimes even our midday program here and now, I also do podcasts. I do digital for everything. See, you cannot, you simply cannot do those things well and do investigative, real investigative reporting at the same time. I count on my colleagues who don't cover the court on a daily basis to do the real investigative reporting. And I want to give it every piece of credit it deserves when it delivers the goods. Although I do have the sense sometimes at the moment that people are willing to make a big deal out of not much. And I'd rather they made a big deal out of a big deal. Nina, thank you so much for taking this time with us this morning. It's been a thrill. Thank you for having me. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Mitch, the conversation with Nina was actually better than I anticipated, and I'm so glad that she agreed to come on Sidebar. Two things really jumped out at me. One of them I wish we'd have more of a follow-up on. One was about the trust within the court. It was really interesting to hear from someone who spends a lot of time with the court, watching the court, understands the court, 
to really understand that the Dobbs leak has caused a fracture in the court. That's pretty significant. I also found it interesting and I wanted to push back a little bit, but it was our last question when we asked about should the court be covered differently? Nina really focused on the idea of the ethics and the investigative reporting. And I think she's right about that. She's not in a position to do the kind of deep investigative reporting that ProPublica and others can. But I think that Dahlia and others who are talking about how the court is covered aren't just focused on the ethics issues. I think they're also focused on the idea that the court isn't acting as a legitimate body anymore in terms of its decision making. And it needs to be covered differently as a result of how it's using its power. I would have liked to have had a follow up with her about that particular comment, because I think it would have been interesting to see how she responded to that. Jackie, as usual, I agree with each of your points. I would add a couple of others because, first of all, I also thoroughly enjoyed it. Nina is a heroine of mine, someone who was a leader in bringing integrity into reporting and news reporting particularly. She did not disappoint. I thought the conversation about the center of the court and the ideological shift in the court was particularly important to listen to from Nina, who's watched the court for almost five decades. For her to be able to say, this is the first Supreme Court I have ever covered that does not have a center, and then explain to us why not having a center focus to bring a collaborative legal viewpoint into the discussion ends up with the type of 6-3 ideological splits that we're seeing on the court and that some of us are concerned about having be the new norm for the court. I thought that was very telling and something that we should all learn from. The other thing I took away was Nina's been covering the court for a long time, and I'm not sure she was quite as sharp against them on the issue of integrity and the code of ethics that I expected. She has watched a lot of courts, a lot of chief justices, and the behavior of this court is so out of line with the integrity and the transparency, the ability to talk openly with the public. This is so different right now with what's going on with the lack of a code of ethics, the lack of filing ethics reports. I expected her to be a little more critical. But then it's easy for us to say it's not our day job. We don't have to look them in the eye one week after the next. Mitch, I couldn't agree more. I was actually surprised by that as well and glad that you kind of pushed back and pushed her a little bit more on should John Roberts be more aggressive in setting up that ethics code. Uh, And it was interesting to hear her response. But What it did for me is just really, I think, gave me insight into a side of the court or or an interior look at the court that I've just never had before. And for that, I absolutely appreciate that she spent this time with us. The last thing I would say, Jackie, is I hope everyone listening spends a little more time paying attention to what is going on with our Supreme Court. It is our Supreme Court. It sets standards that affects every single one of us every single day. And I don't believe we should think of it as some power that's out there in the universe that we don't have any influence on. We do. And one of the comments that we talked about was, are there things the legislature can do, Congress can do, we as citizens can do to to demand more accountability? And I think that's a a takeaway thought for all of us. Once again, I want to thank everyone who joined us today on Sidebar. And as always, Mitch and I would love to know what's on your mind. You can reach us at sidebarmedia.org. Sidebar would not be possible without our producer, David Eakin, who also composes and performs all of the Sidebar music. Thank you also to Gogo Zoger, who manages Sidebar's marketing and social media.
Colleges of Law and Monterey College of Law are part of a larger organization called California Accredited Law Schools. All of our schools are dedicated to providing access and opportunity to a legal education to marginalized communities. For more information about the California Accredited Law Schools, go to calawschools.org. That's calawschools.org.